morning, everyone. Welcome to our time of worship on this Pentecost Sunday. And uh, I mentioned folks could wear red today, and this is about the only red thing I have. So I had to wear a sweater this morning, even though it's not quite sweater weather. So if you see me faint up here from heat exhaustion, you'll know what happened. But uh, today we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, which, of course, uh, and we'll read about it a little bit in our call to worship in a minute is the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church at the time of the Pentecost in the early days of the early church when Jesus sent his spirit into their hearts with, it says, tongues uh, of flame. And so that, that red tongue of flame we represent today uh, as we give thanks to God for that incredible gift without which we would uh, not have life. We would not know uh, the joy of new life in Christ, that it's the Holy Spirit that animates us, it gives us new life, that causes us to be born again uh, when we receive him. So we welcome you in the name of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit as we worship together. Let's stand together for this first song of gathering. And uh, you'll notice there is a theme of the Holy Spirit throughout our uh, worship today. And we begin uh, singing this number 389 in your hymnals if you'd like to follow along there. Uh, Spirit of the living God. so grateful that you have sent your spirit among us, that you sent that spirit to be born in us, to give us new life, to draw us close to yourself, to make us into new creations, you tell us in your word. And we pray, Lord, that that spirit would grow, that we clear out the sin that so easily entangles us and trips us up. We clear out the, the worldliness, we get rid of it, we ask you, Lord, to cleanse us and remake us today in the power of that Holy Spirit, that all that we do might be given new life and a new sense of joy and passion and love through that holy divine power that you send into us, Lord. It's a miraculous thing, and we give you thanks and praise and pray that that Spirit would uh, unify us together as brothers and sisters and that we would be one, Lord Jesus, even as you and the Father and the Spirit are one, that we might reflect your goodness, your glory, your joy today as we worship together in spirit and in truth. And we give you all praise in your holy name. Amen. Friends, take a moment before you have a seat just to greet the folks around you.
Well, again, we welcome you in the name of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and hope that you sense his peace as we gather together uh, to worship him and glorify him together. It is a real privilege to do so. This is the day the Lord has made, the scripture tells us, and so we rejoice and are glad in it. And uh, if you're visiting with us today, there is a, a little prayer card here. If you have a prayer need in your own family or in your life, uh, please fill that out and drop it in one of the offering baskets, which are in the four corners of the sanctuary. There's also a, a welcome side to it where you can put your name and the contact information there if you'd like to be added to our email list or our snail mail list. Uh, draw your attention to that. And, Again, just put it in one of the offering baskets before you leave today. You'll see the insert about our Vacation Bible School coming up in just a couple of weeks, June 1st and 2nd. And uh, pass those cards out. You can use them as sort of an outreach tool. If there's kids in uh, your own kids' class at school they're friends with or uh, some kids in the neighborhood that you could pass it on to them or their parents, uh, please uh, do so. It's a great outreach opportunity for us. Also, just uh, session members, please note we uh, have a meeting of our church elders this Thursday at 5 o'clock. Um, also, if you're interested in uh, joining our church, if you're looking for a church home, we're going to have a, a short meeting after our uh, worship service this morning in the conference room, which is right down the hall to your right, uh, past my study, my office there. And... Uh, We'd love to talk to you more if you're interested in exploring what church membership means here at Royal Oak Church and uh, as, as it's kind of explained in, in the scriptures. Also, in just a few weeks' time, we have an opportunity to serve our community in the Caring for Our Community program that we've participated in and originated here through Alan and Brenda's uh, work and vision, and uh, it's been a fun time of service together as a church family, but also inviting other churches in our community. I think last year there were over, what, 100 volunteers. Uh, so that's coming up soon, and Alan's going to share a few details about that with us. Good morning. Uh, it is that time of year again. We are caring for our communities coming up the 8th and 15th of June, and I'd like to emphasize that Things happen outside of the 8th and 15th, so if that doesn't work for you, 8th and 15th, we can work something else in pre-work, post-work, whatever, just uh, participate in the community, help someone, help, help the town, whatever. We're going to do something a little different this time. We're going to treat uh, the workers uh, with hamburgers and, and some fixings afterwards so that... Uh, kind of bring the community back together for the ones that want to do that. So uh, Brenda said, be sure to emphasize that we're looking for people that would like to help serve in that capacity. And uh, we'll probably bring my smoker grill over and cook the burgers and, and do all of that, but then help with the fixings and the setups. So we're trying to do a little bit different this time. Last year, like Alan said, we uh, had about 115 volunteers. We um, did about 23 or four projects last year. Man, that was a headache to scatter everybody, collect everybody, get everything out there. So we're doing a little bit bigger projects this year. The American Legion has asked for some help and we're gonna work with uh, Crossroads, Harry Howe, he's gonna help build a, a new ramp, but uh, we're, we're scoping it out, getting the materials and gonna take down the old one and then he and his team will build a new one they need some help with some couple of bathrooms to make them handicap uh, ready. That may be an inappropriate term these days, but uh, ADA compliant, I guess it is. And uh, we've got a lot of work we'd like to do at the police station. I don't know if you've been up there lately. Uh, we've had that on the radar for two or three years. It's been on Brenda's heart for two or three years. She's trying to drive that earlier, but we didn't have the wherewithal to do it. This year, we're going to kind of do a revamp there. The town is going to help us by pulling out some cruddy old bushes and we're going to do some landscaping. The whole back needs painting. It's not just a police station. It's a uh, senior citizen there as well. That's where they meet. And if uh, our uh, police chief is okay with it, we may have our cookout up there and serve up there because that's where most of the workers will be. We're going to do painting, cleaning, 
in the back, uh, gardening in the front and the side, so we'll put a lot of effort there. There are other things going on, and there's a host of things. And truthfully, if you have anything that you know of you'd like to put on our list, uh, it's available. We're, we'd love to have input from other people, and if you've got a project you'd like to do, get two or three. Uh, you, you know, it's not that we're doing it, it's you're doing it, you know, and get to two or three and get it done and, and on that weekend or whenever you want to do it. But we do have posters starting to be put out, one up here, and there's some in the back back there announcing the 8th and 15th. If you are so inclined, we'd like to, for you to pre-register. I mean, if you got an iPhone, just scan that little code, uh, barcode, and it'll jump right on there and put your name in and all that. And if you need help, we'll do that for you. But uh, we're looking for a good year this year. We've got a 10-member board that Alan is on it, myself and Brenda and some others, and uh, we're trying to broaden it across the community. We've got people at Walmart who are wanting to get teams. Teams work great if we've got people that can pull a team together. That would be wonderful. So um, got people you'd like to work with, get two or three and say, hey, we'd like to do a smaller project. We work that out. And uh, we appreciate everybody that does it. And I know the town really appreciates it. And uh, thank you all. And any questions, you can ask Brenda, myself, or Pastor Allen. So we're all uh, getting ready. It's getting time to start hustling to pull this together. I'm kind of working on about 50% capacity myself in terms of limping around, so it's going to be a little more challenging this year, but we'll get her done. But anyway, any questions, please feel free to ask. All right. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Brenda, as well. Let's set this back in here. One of the questions that uh, I always want us to consider and other church uh, growth folks have talked about is uh, asking ourselves if our church ceased to exist uh, suddenly what would our town and our community miss uh, would they even know that we were gone and so we want to make a difference in this community we want to have an impact here and if we were gone we want to leave a big hole and uh, part of that is is uh, just being a visible presence out in the community knowing that we care about this community and Old Testament talks about uh, to the exiles, you know, wherever you are, wherever you're carried off into exile, be a blessing uh, to that town, to that community, to that city. Because as, as it prospers, you too shall prosper. Uh, and so uh, we want to be Christ's light in this community and sharing our faith, uh, both through our words, but also through our actions. And in fact, our actions often speak much louder than words, and that might be painting up at uh, a school or at, or at the firehouse or doing work at the police station or at the Henderson School. Uh, it, it could be helping individuals, low-income folks or elderly folks. We've helped uh, with various projects, yard work and different things uh, for low-income folks and elderly folks in the community. So it can be as uh, varied as whatever projects you all refer uh, to us as a board, to Alan and Brenda. Uh, so yeah, if you see needs in, a com in our community, uh, please uh, let us know because we do as a church family and we we're trying to bring sister churches along into this effort So it's not just about Royal Oak. In fact, we had a good number from Royal Oak last year, maybe around 30 volunteers uh, But uh, but so we were uh, we had a great showing of that uh, 115 volunteers, but we're trying to get more sister churches involved So if we have friends in other congregations, maybe mention it to them ask them say uh, ask your pastor about this and see if they can be involved in well, uh, be in, involved in that as well. I want to lift up our church family in prayer. I uh, mentioned in the email uh, that I sent out on Friday that Reagan Burchett uh, had a severe knee injury, uh, sadly, during a soccer game uh, recently and tore her ACL. Um, and I assume it will require surgery. But they don't have any plans for that yet. Still consulting with doctors, so pray for. For Reagan, also lifting up the family of Linda McCord. Um, didn't know about her uh, passing. Linda died last Sunday, um, uh, and we didn't know about that till after our worship service. And uh, that is the mom of Michael McCord Jr., who has a work team here with his ministry called Mission Element. 
and we had dinner with Michael and his family on Wednesday evening, and the uh, work team is arriving, arrived yesterday, and we'll be working, doing trail outreach. Uh, we're partnering with Troutdale Baptist Church up in Troutdale, and that's where they are this morning. Mike said he felt kind of torn. He would love to have been worshiping here with his uh, church family. Mike grew up in this church, uh, but they are partnering with that church, so they felt like they needed to reconnect uh, with that church body this morning, which I completely understand. Um, uh, but Linda, um, uh, the service is not planned yet. Uh, so, and I was a little confused about, they've been in transition between Georgia and Hayside. Linda had already moved to Hayside, and that's where the service will be. And she had connected with a church there. Uh, so that's where the service will eventually be. And I'll let the congregation know as soon as I know, uh, once they decide on a service of time. But Mike said uh, she was cremated, and it'll probably be a couple weeks before they have a service with he and his uh, sister Elizabeth are planning that. So just keep Michael and his family in your prayers. And let's bow together in a, in a time of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship. Thank you, Lord, that we can come knowing that you are a loving Father who does not treat us as our sins deserve. We confess, Lord, that we are sinners, that all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And we ask that you would cleanse us and remake us today, Lord. We do lift up our community. We pray that we would be a blessing here, that the, that the community would notice if we were suddenly gone from the corner of Sheffield and Main Street here in Marion. Help us, Lord, to be salt and light in this place. And we pray that you'd be in the midst of the Caring for Our Community ministry and the service days coming up and guide us all as we seek to serve our neighbors in need and to be a blessing to this community. We do lift up Reagan to you, Lord. We pray for healing for her knee, that you knit it back together and just direct them to the right doctors that will help uh, bring healing. We pray for Mike McCord and Elizabeth McCord and their whole family, Lord, in the wake of their mom's, Linda's death. We're thankful for Linda and her faith in you, Lord, and that she's now with you. And um, we uh, thank thankful, Lord, for all the years of service she gave to this church. And we're grateful, Lord, for uh, you calling her home and that she's now at perfect peace and rest. Come among us, Lord, today and change our hearts. Help us to be soft-hearted and not cold and hard-hearted today. Help us to have fertile soil in our hearts that your word could be planted into soil that is rich and deep. And uh, Lord, we uh, just lift up our hearts to you today in the name of Jesus, who has taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand for our responsive call to worship. This is taken from Acts 2 in the story of the Pentecost. For those of you who got here early this morning, we didn't have any power in the building, uh, just kind of emergency power. The power is off in this uh, area of downtown Marion, apparently. Uh, but I was saying, we don't need physical power. We got spiritual power. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, God was good to restore the, the physical power as well today. But even if we didn't, have it restored. We were going to worship uh, regardless. And uh, so it is in that spiritual power of the Holy Spirit that we gather today. And this is part of that story. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, the disciples. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Amen. Friends, let's continue our worship together, singing Holy Spirit. today and be made new. Take these broken hearts, Lord, these hearts that are bandaged from the wounds we've experienced in this broken world, some of them self-inflicted wounds, Lord, from our own sin, 
and heal us and cleanse us and hold us close, Lord, with your righteous right hand. Hold us up so that we can survive, so that we can maintain our hope in the midst of despair. Help us, Lord, to hold out your light in a dark world and help us to plant seeds of hope in the people we meet. We dedicate all that we are, Lord, to you and for your glory because you are the only source of living water. You are the only source of eternal life and all that we have is yours. And so we dedicate those things, Lord, our lives and all that we have to you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Kids are going to come up and share a song with us. This is a song that we've sung before, and if you'd like to, to join uh, in clapping or singing with this song, you'll be you're welcome to do so. It's the uh, this is a song. And have a good group of crowd. This is a song that uh, we are familiar with. It's based on the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of a new take on the Lord's Prayer. Good to have a fresh take. Sometimes things get sort of so rote that we forget their true meaning. So as we sing, hear the kids sing, uh, just uh, think about the, the prayers that we offer up to God.
Thank you all so much. Great job. The younger children can come over and uh, have a seat right over here. Let's have a short message before Stacy takes you out with the big ministry. Seat right up here. That's great. Spot over here, Stephen. Well, today we are celebrating, as I said, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is one of those things that's a little bit hard to imagine, right? We talk about there being one, there's one God and only one God. And that God is comes to us in three persons. And it's the Father. Can you guys, anybody remember what the three persons of the Godhead are? The Father. And what else? The Father sent his, his what into the world? Jesus is what? Jesus is God's Son. He sent Jesus into the world. The Father sent the Son. And then the Father and the Son, the scriptures tell us, sent the Holy Spirit. And so those three persons are one God. It's kind of like, you know, I'm one person, but I'm a father. I'm also a son to my mom and dad. And I'm a husband to my wife. So we have different parts of who we are, our character, uh, and it's the same with God. Or sometimes people said, talked about that uh, water can come in different forms. Water can be a liquid. What's this in here? This water's a liquid, right? Yeah, you're welcome to touch it any time. Sometimes I'll go by, the, this is where we baptize folks, and sometimes I'll go by and I'll put a little water on my finger and I'll make the sign of the cross, just like I do when I baptize people. And it just reminds me that, that we're baptized in Christ. We've, we're called to remember our baptism. And so water is one, it's a liquid form, of, of, of that, of H2O. And there's a, a solid form of water. What do we call that? Ice, right. So that's the second form. What's another kind of water? What, did, what fell a good bit of the time yesterday? It was rain, but there's also sort of mist, right? And fog. And some, sometimes water can be a vapor. It can be uh, in the air. And there's humidity in the air right now. Uh, And so God has uh, three persons that he comes to us. And we experience God in those three different ways. As a loving father, as a savior and Lord and Jesus that came to earth and died on the cross for our sin. And then Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. So Jesus isn't just living here. God is everywhere all the time. But the scripture says this amazing thing that that if we ask Jesus to live in our hearts, he'll come in and he'll live there. He'll make a home in our hearts. And Jesus says, "If, if you live in me and if I live in you, then you'll bear spiritual fruit. You'll be full of love and joy and his peace. So, Whenever you're getting frustrated, maybe, uh, with something going on in life, whenever you're sad, just remember remember that the Holy Spirit, Jesus and the Father, send the Holy Spirit so that we can take God's presence with us wherever we go. Not just here in church, but you can take him to school. Jesus, through the Spirit, will be with with you there on the bus or in the car going on a trip this summer, maybe, or at home at the breakfast table or in the classroom, wherever you are. Exactly, exactly. Anywhere you go, he'll still be there. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are uh, wherever we go in the world and that you're, uh, by faith, you can dwell in our hearts. And we pray that that would be true for all of us today, Lord. Uh, These children, Lord, we're thankful for them, for their faith in you, through such as these, you tell us, belongs the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, we're thankful for their faith in you. And just continue to build that faith. Thank you for their beautiful song this morning. 
And thank you, Lord, that your spirit is with us wherever we go. Bless them and their families and all of us, Lord, as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks so much for coming up. Stacey will take the little ones out. So today in our passage from the book of Ruth, the story continues to build really to a climax as Ruth's bold request to Boaz to marry her uh, and act as the kinsman or the guardian redeemer for her and Naomi, her mother-in-law, has one more hurdle to overcome. As we saw last week, Boaz responds positively to Ruth's request that he does indeed to marry her. But in order to do so properly, Boaz informs Ruth that there is actually another kinsman redeemer who is in fact more closely related to the family than he is. And so therefore, Boaz has to approach that closer relative and find out if he's interested in functioning in that crucial role. And Boaz assures Ruth that if this closer relative is not willing to take on this responsibility and marry Ruth, then Boaz himself will surely marry her. So let's pick up our reading in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because it, I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in the earlier times in Israel for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I've also acquired Ruth, the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are my witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. This is God's word. So when Boaz first approaches the more closely related kinsman redeemer, it seems as though this unnamed man is willing to carry out the deal, which he assumed just involves a matter of property, buying back the property of the land uh, which Naomi was selling. And but when this man learned that the deal would not only include purchasing this land, but also require him to marry Ruth, he suddenly changes his mind. In verse 5, Boaz 
says uh, that there are some strings attached to the purchase of the land. In effect, Boaz says, oh, uh, by the way, you're going to buy the land, but you're also going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabitess. He doesn't sell it real hard, it seems like, because he's really smitten with Ruth, it seems like. And uh, you're going to have to buy, uh, uh, you're going to have to marry Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. So not to get too deep in the woods here on this, some of these Old Testament uh, laws, but this is basically a combination of the kinsman redemption or the buying back of property that's been uh, put in some kind of debt or been lost in some way. Uh, this outlined in Leviticus 25 and other places with what's called Leverite marriage as described in Deuteronomy 25, in which most typically a brother would help produce children in the name of a deceased brother who died without having any children through that dead brother's widow. But in this case, it's not just a brother, but a close relative, probably a cousin who's being asked to fulfill that role. So this is really kind of an unusual application of Leverite marriage and honestly a pretty big ask, right? A pretty big request uh, of this kinsman redeemer is evidenced by him quickly and suddenly backing out of the land deal. And he says, oh, oh well, wait a minute. I, I had, you know, I didn't have that in mind. I don't have any interest in marrying uh, this Moabite, Ruth. You need to do it. And so Boaz immediately steps in and uh, he announces not only to the elders, but to all the people there in Bethlehem. He says, today you are witnesses that I bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech. And I've also acquired Ruth the Moabite as my wife. And I will marry her. And again, you are my witnesses of this. So he wants to make it very clear that he's embracing this responsibility. So while this unnamed closer relative backs out of the deal basically because of Ruth, Boaz jumps in with both feet. He's ready to take on this responsibility. He jumps at the chance. The unnamed closer relative, in a sense, and from a worldly point of view, probably made the logical choice. Ruth was an outsider. She was a hated Moabite from a nation that was fierce and a despised enemy of the Israelites. They were a people who worshiped a pagan God, who among other detestable practices, uh, also practiced child sacrifice. Mary and Ruth would likely complicate issues of inheritance and trying to keep straight down through the generations whose land was whose, keeping your previously owned property in the state separate from the redeemed property. It would involve maintaining property that wouldn't in the long run be in your family. In short, it would be a bit complicated. And that's kind of what we often do, isn't it? When we see some complicated situation, we're like, you know, where someone asks us for help. We're like, at first maybe we're willing, but then we see, oh, you know, this is getting kind of complicated. You've got a lot of problems more than I realize. I think I'm out. This is a little bit too complex for me. It's a little bit too weird, a little bit too strange. I haven't dealt with something like this before, so I'm out. But Boaz didn't do that. Even with these complicating issues, Boaz is smart enough to realize that, in fact, Ruth is the best part of this deal. It turns out that Ruth really is his main motivation for wanting to be the kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. Through Naomi's witness, Ruth has turned away from the paganism in which she was raised, and she's embraced Yahweh, the God of Israel, as her own personal savior. Ruth's faithfulness has already become well known and was beautifully articulated in her famous pledge to Naomi back in chapter one. When she said to Naomi, Naomi was trying to send her back to her own people, back to Moab. And said, I don't really have a lot for you to offer. And Ruth famously said to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. 
Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. Where you're buried, so will I be buried. And so Ruth, through that experience of God's grace and salvation, is really transformed into a remarkably faithful and devoted young woman who works tirelessly to support her mother-in-law, Naomi. For months throughout the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, Ruth worked as a gleaner in Boaz's fields. And, you know, we might romanticize gleaning a little bit. It was taking up the, the leftover stalks that were laying in the fields. But there really was no romance about gleaning back in the ancient times. It'd be like it's a, uh, akin to people collecting aluminum cans in our day and time. You know, it's kind of a humbling thing. You know, you see somebody out there collecting Sometimes they're doing it for altruistic reasons. Sometimes they're doing it just to make a little bit of money. And that's really kind of the modern equivalent of gleaning. And she was a really honorable woman who won this stellar reputation and was selflessly doing everything she could to care for Naomi. And we'll get into this more next week. Bruce's marriage to Boaz, though, produces a son, ultimately, named Obed. And Obed... Becomes the father of Jesse. Jesse becomes the father of David. And through David and his line, God will eventually bring his son into the world. So while this unnamed redeemer really just wanted to acquire the blessing of more land, more property, which, you know, is always an attractive proposition for any of us, Boaz recognized Ruth's incredible value as a noble person, as a wonderful woman of God. It was really Ruth you might say, who was the pearl of great value hidden in Boaz's field. She was that pearl of great price, hidden, like a, a dis disguised as a gleaner. Ruth is the great prize in this story of God's redemption. It was Ruth who, as the women tell Naomi toward the end of the book, is worth to Naomi more than seven sons, which is a remarkable statement Again, considering this is 3,000 years ago, very patriarchal culture where women uh, were not uh, held in the same esteem as men. And this is incredible praise of Ruth's character. And Bo Boaz wisely recognizes that a marriage with this remarkable young woman, Ruth, would in itself be a great reward. And so Boaz is willing to, in a sense, sacrifice all he has for the sake of this marriage. Again, the man who was the unnamed closer relative, was unwilling to risk losing, quote, what he said he called his estate by marrying Ruth, meaning he was afraid that he would somehow lose his property, his wealth, his social standing by being associated with this strange outsider, this outcast, this penniless foreigner, and that he would somehow lose his, his own fame, his own identity, by basically producing an heir not for his own sake, but for the sake of a dead man. Again, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a big ask. And you can imagine that uh, in that day and time, again, if it was a brother who died, you might think, oh, this sister-in-law of mine, she's, she's penniless, she's really struggling, I'll bring her into my house and I'll fulfill this need. But, you know, if it was like a, a second, third, fourth cousin, you're like, who, Ruth? I'm supposed to marry Ruth? I don't, I've never even met this person. Who are you talking about? And so you can imagine from this unnamed closer relative's perspective that it was, a, again, a big ask. But one of the, the great ironies of the story is that the name of the man who was a closer relative and who could have married Ruth and become that uh, kinsman redeemer is completely lost to history. And Boaz's name and Ruth's name will live forever in God's word as recorded again in Matthew's gospel in chapter one, verse five, where it lists the genealogy of Jesus. And again, it says Boaz, father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth as part of that historical list of uh, Jesus ancestors. So Jesus, so Boaz basically gives his ordinary life away. In exchange, God gives Boaz an extraordinary life, a 
life more of something more than he could ever hope for. It's exactly what Jesus talks about when he's speaking about a thousand years after the events chronicled here in the book of Ruth, when he described losing your life for his sake and the sake of the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 38, he says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life, Jesus said, will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So Jesus explains that in the kingdom of God, the only things that we really get to keep are the things we give away. That's really all we're able to keep is the things that we give away. We try to hold on to our lives for ourselves and our own purposes and dreams and don't surrender our lives to God, then we're going to lose it. But if we turn our lives over to Christ and allow the Lord to direct our path, if we allow him to use our gifts for his glory, for his kingdom, then we'll, we'll find it. And we'll have a richer life full of joy and love and blessing and peace beyond measure. Isn't that what we all want? Not just an ordinary life, not just a life successful by worldly standards of how much money we accumulate, how many possessions we have, he who has the most toys at the end wins. That's not what the Bible says, is it? Are we rich in the things of God? Are we rich in the things of God's kingdom? Are we storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not just on earth. The world tells us just the opposite, really. The world tells us to hold on to everything we've got, to not let go. Don't let anyone, the world says, deny you your rights. And that's the whole kind of cultural conversation these days. Defending my rights, your rights to happiness, your rights to comfort, your rights to pleasure. The world tells us that happiness comes from getting away from responsibility and fighting for our rights. I can't tell you how many times I've had people talk to me about some issue they're struggling with and there's, they say something like, don't I have a right to be happy? And they're often engaging in something that the Bible says they really shouldn't be doing. And they're using that as, a, as an excuse for their immoral behavior. And I want to say to them, that's not in the Bible. There's no right to happiness. Instead, the Bible talks about our responsibilities before God, our, our need to serve him. Uh, that we, we need to surrender our lives and not make demands of our rights, but to give our rights away for the betterment of others, for the blessing of others, to sacrifice ourselves just as Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. He's our mom. And he laid it all down for each and every one of us. He didn't demand his rights as the son of God. He gave them up. He emptied himself and became nothing, Paul says in Philippians 2. and became a servant. He lowered himself and that night before his death, he even washed the feet of his disciples, a lowly servant's task. And so instead of demanding our rights all the time, we need to flip the script and really say, Lord, what can I give up in order to serve you, in order to serve the people around me? Jesus in the gospel call us not to shirk responsibilities, but to shoulder responsibilities by taking up our cross. I mean, what do you think the cross is? It's a burden. It's, 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 a, it's a responsibility that Christ has called us to bear up the hard hill to Calvary, just as Jesus did. And, and frankly, that's why so many young people feel lost and confused in today's world. Because they, they wonder why they are so restless, so bored, so unengaged, so unhappy and anxious. It's because they've bought into this lie 
by the world and the media that fulfillment, again, comes from sort of shirking responsibility and pursuing as their ultimate goal material possessions and physical pleasures. But after a while, those worldly, fleshly indulgements become boring. And you can only be entertained for so long before you have to move on to some other bigger thrill, some louder, flashier distraction or entertainment. And after a few years of that false pursuit of joy, you get kind of jaded and bitter about the whole state of the world. You realize that it's kind of a false kind of pleasure, whether through money or fame or power or prestige or entertainment. None of those worldly pleasures ultimately lead to a life of meaning, a life of purpose. Jesus says that that cross, though, is, is not burdensome when we bear it through the power of the Spirit. That that burden is really light because we're empowered to do whatever Whatever that sacrifice is, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to carry that cross. And so his burden is light. His load is easy. His yoke is easy. And through the power of the Spirit, we can fulfill that calling that Jesus fulfilled in going to the cross. Boaz's choice to marry Ruth demonstrates that what Jesus taught, which is that real fulfillment comes through uh, shouldering responsibility through putting on whatever that cross is by denying yourself in growing degrees and shouldering whatever sacrifice God has called you to make, that, that true life comes by giving, again, your life away for the sake of others. And that sacrifice may, might take one of a million different forms in your life. It might mean sacrificing your time as you care for an aging parent. As they become more and more dependent on you. Parents, it might mean sacrificing sleep to stay up through the night with a, with a sick child. Husbands, uh, that might mean sacrificing watching that ball game that you really wanted to watch because maybe your wife needs to talk about something that's heavy on her heart. God calls us to sacrifice, to give our lives away to others in both big and in small ways. So Jesus' wise teaching shows that the key to happiness and fulfillment is again not by shirking those responsibilities, but by shouldering them, just as Christ did for us. So as we follow Jesus, that's really what our lives should look like, bearing that cross daily. And as Boaz pledges himself to Ruth in marriage, it reminds us that marriage itself is an institution that God created from the earliest days of creation to be a beautiful human expression of the Lord's sacrificial love for us. God created marriage as a, as a living, perpetual portrait of Christ's redemptive love for the church, which is often referred to in Scripture as his bride. Apostle Paul reflects on the beauty of marital love uh, as he quotes from Genesis 2, and comments on it in Ephesians 5, verse 31. He says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, Paul says, but I am speaking about Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So Paul says that marriage is really a living portrait of Jesus' love for us the church as his bride, and that husband and wife are to mirror that divine love by sacrificially loving and sincerely respecting one another. Tim Keller writes, and this is a quote of the week in your bulletin there in the back, says, within this Christian vision of marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It is to look at another person and get a glimpse of what God has created and to say, I see who God is making you, and it excites me. I want to be a part of that. I want to partner with you and God in the journey you are taking to his throne. And when we get there, I will look at your magnificence and say, I always knew you could be like this. I got a glimpse of it on earth, but now look at you. That's the kind of godly 
understanding of marriage that excited Boaz and motivated him to marry Ruth. Boaz saw this amazing woman of God, and he was willing to connect his future with hers. He was excited to journey throughout the remainder of his life and create with her a family together. As I often tell younger couples in premarital counseling, marriage is not just a promise of present love, but it's also a promise of future love. Uh, it's easy to love when we sort of, as they classically say in Hollywood, fall in love, it's sort of this romantic view of marital love. Um, when we're, it's easy to say that when we're young and attractive and strong and fit and things are going well. But in the covenant of marriage, you're promising to love your spouse your, your entire life and through whatever circumstances may come. As the, as the vows say, in plenty and in want, or for richer, for poor, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as you both shall live. And that's a promise of present and future life. Love and faithfulness, that no matter how challenging life becomes, uh, that you will be with them. And that's what brings meaning and joy to, to marriage. And I'm sure Ruth and Boaz's marriage wasn't perfect. They probably had fights just like every uh, healthy marriage does, but with faith and mutual selflessness and sacrifice, they committed themselves to one another. Uh, this year, Kelly and I celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary, and uh, the story of Ruth has always been a theme of our uh, marital life. On the inside of the ring that Kelly gave to me on our wedding day was inscribed that very uh, passage I read earlier from Ruth 1, verses 16 and 17, uh, where again, it says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, uh, maybe except for your, young, your next oldest brother, uh, and your God will be my God. Um, where you, you know, where you die, uh, that's where I will be as well. And I even showed the plot that my parents very lovingly uh, bought us. There's a family plot there right across from my little home church in Huntersville, North Carolina. I said, honey, here's our little place in the country. You know, uh, we got a spot all picked out. And uh, they bought not only a, a grave for themselves, but for my two brothers and their spouses. And they were as thrilled as you can imagine when they... And they saw that. And that pledge of, faithful no, of faithfulness is uh, really a beautiful illustration of God's love for us in Christ. Like Ruth, Jesus selflessly pledged himself to us despite the cost. Like Boaz, Jesus sacrificed his life and gave his life away for us. And like Boaz as well, Jesus chose us and redeemed us by buying us back from our slavery to sin, and pulling us back from the brink of death and into his loving arms. So friends, as we reflect on this beautiful marriage of Boaz and Ruth, let's rejoice and give thanks that Jesus has sacrificed himself on the cross for us and faithfully bought us back at the cost of his own life out of his great love for you and for me. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice Thank you, Lord, for the new life that you offer to us. And we praise you as the risen one. And again, we are thankful, Lord, that the cross we bear is not as burdensome as it could be through the power of your spirit. You give us the strength to, to carry that cross. Lord, it will be a struggle at times, and we will feel pushed to our limits, but... You tell us that you will hold us up and strengthen us and lead us through uh, through whatever challenge may come. And so, Lord, we're grateful for the gift of your spirit and the uh, gift that your sacrifice brought about. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as we come to the conclusion of our worship this morning. I invite you to say together our common faith of what we believe this confession of faith from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, uh, let's join our voices in this closing hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's number 393 in your hymnal if you'd like to follow along. Friends, go now in the comfort and courage of our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.